All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Knight, and I am the Communications Director here at North Country Community College. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome Joan Collins to North Country Live. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Joan in just a minute. Um, I do want to first uh, tell you a little, a little bit about North Country Live because I realized that there might be some folks that are here for the first time seeing one of our programs, and there might be some folks that are returners. Um, you might learn a little bit more about it just in a few seconds here. So let me just tell you a little, little bit about North Country Live. This is the third installment of our spring semester of programs. Um, North Country Live started back in the spring of 2020, if you can all remember, back to what was happening then as we were still quarantining at home at the start of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and wondering what can we do with our time and how does Zoom work? Um, we thought it was an opportunity for the college to uh, engage with our communities by presenting programs that you might find of interest, programs that uh, spark conversation, programs that showcase people in our community with a lot of talent and skills and knowledge like Joan and people from the college, our faculty members as well. Um, so that's why we're excited to um, continue to be able to do um, these kinds of programs for the community um, virtually. Honestly, we've been getting so many people virtually, it's been um, a great success. Uh, and I know we'd get some on, when we do it in person on campus again at some point too. And we're looking forward to that down the line. Um, so far, North Country Live has hosted more than 35 programs. Last fall, our series was focused entirely on the arts and music. And we've also hosted sessions on wellness and gardening and climate change, uh, backcountry preparedness, you name it. Um, next week, we're gonna be partnering with Historic Saranac Lake and Trudeau Institute to present a program on popular resistance to vaccines and other public health measures, a uh, pretty timely subject. So if you haven't done so already, you can register for that program, same place you registered for this one, uh, and that's at nccc.edu slash live. I'll share that before the program is done tonight. Um, so you can uh, learn more about uh, vaccine resistance and historically both as as well as uh, present day. Um, just a note that I've mentioned uh, we'll be recording tonight's program so you can share it with others and watch it again. It will be posted to the live page later today or, or tomorrow morning that same website I just mentioned. Uh, before we start here I would ask everyone to keep their microphones on mute and uh, just to prevent any distractions so please uh, stay on mute during the program. If you do have any questions as we're going along, feel free to use the chat and type them in the chat and I'll kind of put them all together and we'll try to get some of those questions answered uh, as best as we can from Joan at the end of the program. Um, we'll be going for about an hour or so tonight, just time-wise. Um, so a little bit about tonight's program, Winter Bird Visitors of Northern New York. Um, Joan Collins is president of Adirondack Aviation Expeditions and Workshops. She leads birding trips year round She's a New York State licensed guide and Adirondack 46er. She's climbed all of the Adirondack Fire Tower peaks too. Uh, Joan is a past president of the New York State Ornithological Association, and she's the current editor of New York Birders. She's a past uh, board of directors member of the Audubon Council of New York State, past president and current board of directors member of the Northern New York Audubon Society. Uh, Joan has also published several journal, magazine, and newspaper articles on wildlife and conservation topics in various publications, including Audubon, New York Birders, Conservationist, Adirondack Life Magazine, Local ADK Magazine, and The Kingbird. She authored several warbler species accounts, in addition to serving as a peer reviewer for the second atlas of breeding birds in New York State. Joan is a frequent keynote speaker and teaches classes on orn ornitholo ornithology topics, always trips me up, um, and she's going to be doing an in-person presentation uh, this summer. We're going to mention that before the night is out as well. And I'll also tag her uh, Facebook page and uh, share her website with you if you want to know some more as uh, the program continues here. So without any further ado, uh, Joe, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks for being with us tonight. Okay, thank you. And uh, I need to share my screen. I... <laughs> Let's see. You got it. Yeah, this is always that transition. I do. <laughs> moment. Okay. Fingers crossed kind of a thing. Right. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, we're in there. All right. And oops. There we go. Okay. 
and I can't move that down. So um, can everyone see okay? Uh, can you see okay, everyone? Looks good, Joan. Yep, there's okay, a little bar <laughs> there at the top, but I think that'll disappear once you get into the program. Oh, it will? Okay, yeah, because it's blocking it a little bit. It's not a problem. It's just blocking the photos a little bit. Well, it was. it's really nice to see the names. Um, sometimes I, I wish I could just sort of chat with all the people that I see, because I know quite a few people that are um, participating tonight. So, And a number of people like Amy Fryman and Margo that I haven't seen in a very long time. So anyway, really nice to see you all and nice that you could join us. This is a really fun presentation. Um, I give some presentations on climate change, which can be really depressing, but this one is, is really fun because these birds are really interesting. Um, they're birds that uh, many of them come from the Arctic and we only get to see them very briefly during the winter. And um, they're really fascinating birds. Um, the bird on the, the screen that's on my, uh, my introductory slide here is uh, a, a very young white-winged crossbill male that I photographed on Sabatis Road a couple of years ago. That's a beautiful bird, and we'll talk about that bird tonight. So uh, the three different topics that I'll be speaking about, and that's a snowy owl. I think everybody probably knows that. I photographed that bird over in Jefferson County um, in the Point Peninsula area. Uh, very, very white. I think that's probably the whitest male I've ever found. Just a beautiful snowy owl. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about migration very briefly. Why do birds move around? Um, and then I'm going to cover uh, 18 winter bird visitors, which is not all of them, but um, you know some of the some of the more interesting ones. And some of them we'll spend a little more time on than others. And then at the end, I'll tell you where you can go to see these winter visitors that we get and that bring people to our area from all over. Um, been guiding all winter for the crossbills, and we'll talk about the crossbills coming up. So um, you know, diving into this topic of migration. Migration is fundamentally about food, not temperature. So lots of times people think that the birds leave here um, toward the end of the summer because it's getting cold, but really it's all about their food sources. So if it starts to get cold, we don't have the same insects or if the ice comes on the lakes, uh, we lose the water birds. And so really um, birds, because they're warm blooded, they have to continually eat. And so their movements are usually almost all about food. Um, and birds that can find enough to eat during the winter rarely migrate, and we'll talk about that. And then those whose food supplies are seasonal must move, like uh, olive-sided flycatchers that eat dragonflies, for instance, they, they can't stay here during the winter. Um, and so there's more than 500 North American species that migrate out of about 800 that we have in North America. So most of the birds are moving around. Um, ducks and wading birds, uh, their food gets sealed up by the ice. and uh, sometimes, um, so especially with the, the ever-changing weather conditions that we have now with climate change, uh, the ice can come on a little too fast and sometimes loons get stranded because loons need about a quarter mile to take off. They're very heavy birds, so they often get uh, trapped. And so people will go out and try to rescue them with boats um, and get them to a place where they can take off. Um, insectivorous songbirds usually leave, so um, they, there's because no insects, especially right now, it's been really cold. Um, and the seed eaters are the ones that are um, less likely to leave. So what are these patterns of migration? Um, they're usually seasonal movements, but they're not always north and south. The blue grouse, for instance, goes up in elevation out west um, in the winter, and then it comes down in the spring. Um, our common loon, for instance, uh, in the Adirondacks has been tracked to go east to the Atlantic. So it, it winters uh, east of here um, and then comes back as soon as it can. And, it, and they've backed up their, their nesting a month already from climate change and the changes in the ice patterns. Um, and the distances can be shorter long. So some of our birds actually move to just Southern New York, for instance, and sometimes they, they go much farther to Central America, South America. So the distances that, that birds move are, are very varied depending on what they need to eat. What are some of the migration strategies? And that's a big mouth thrush. Um, that's our only endemic species in the, in the Northeastern US. And that brings people from all over the world to see that bird to our area. Um, and so these birds all leave. So they, they go to the Caribbean, um, the end of September, beginning of October. Uh, so these are birds that pretty much all leave, flycatchers, thrushes, vireos, hummingbirds, and wood warblers. Um, and some of them don't go very far. There's yellow, uh, yellow rumped warblers that actually winter over on Lake Ontario um, in Jefferson County, um, which is really just directly west of the Adirondacks. So, uh, you know, the, some of them don't go very far at all. Like I said, some go to Central America and South America. So it kind of depends on the species. 
And then we have partial migrants um, like robins. I'm sure many of you have been seeing robins all winter. I have, uh, particularly down in the uh, Lake Champlain Valley. Uh, belted kingfishers, we tally now on every Christmas bird count because there's always a little open water uh, with climate change somewhere and they don't need much open water to stay around. Eastern bluebirds have been around all winter, uh, many sparrow species and uh, water birds. If there's, if there's open water, you will find, and there's been open water on Lake Champlain all winter and there's been plenty of ducks down there to see. And juncos, for instance, have changed pretty dramatically. Um, you know, 20, 25 years ago, they, we wouldn't have them overwintering here in Long Lake. Um, and then it got to the point where it got warm enough that my local breeder, because we have one that always breeds in the backyard, uh, started staying around. And now I've got little flocks of juncos, dark-eyed juncos. So um, the, the switch that they anticipated happening, uh, Albany, uh, our climate would become more like Albany's climate has pretty much already happened. I was remarking this winter to my husband that all of the bird life at my feeders this winter was not anything like I'd have 20 years ago. Uh, the birds have really completely changed from the warming up that's happening. Then there's the resident birds, um, like uh, Northern Cardinals. And Northern Cardinals still move around a lot, even though they're resident. We get a lot of Northern Cardinals in the Adirondacks now in the towns in the winter because they find uh, pl places with feeders, um, even though they, they're not nesting. Um, they're pretty much nesting still mostly in the valleys in the Lake, Cham Lake Champlain and St. Lawrence Valleys. Um, chickadees stay around, uh, many woodpeckers like pileated woodpeckers, hairy woodpeckers, downy woodpeckers stay around, blackback woodpeckers, nuthatches, um, red-breasted and white-breasted nuthatches, but they, they can even have seasonal movement. Sometimes if there isn't enough food, the red-breasted nuthatches will make big movements to the south, um, thrilling everybody in the southern states because they get to see red-breasted nuthatches in winter. That's a pileated woodpecker there. There's a male on the right and a, a, a baby female um, in a nest hole on the left. Um, this is a, a common red pole, and this is an eruptive bird, and it used to have uh, an eruptive pattern of every other year. So every other winter, I would get between three and 500 of these birds at my feeders in winter, um, and their, their pattern has changed with climate change, and I think it's been about eight years now. The pattern got disrupted, and it really hasn't gone back to what it used to be. So everything is changing again, um, but we do pretty regularly see this bird in winter and they just made a big movement into the North country here in the past week, um, the common red pole. Pine gross beaks um, are sort of an irregular migrant down here from the North. They come whenever there's a good uh, fruit source down here where they don't have a good fruit source to the North. Uh, snowy owls we're seeing now um, pretty much every winter in Jefferson County, which is where I go over to see them. And they used to be more irregular, but um, there's been a major disruption to the Subnivian layer, which is that layer between the snow and the ground. So the lemming population has been disrupted, which is their main food source. And I'm definitely seeing that in the small mammal population with mice um, in the Adirondacks too. And the barred owls are really struggling most years to find food, they're resident owls. Um, Rough-legged hawks are birds that we see pretty much in the open country in the valleys um, every year, sometimes in very big numbers, sometimes in smaller numbers. And they have a winter territory, and we'll talk a little bit about them. And Bohemian waxwings, um, and they just made a big movement into the area in the past week, which is pretty late. Um, sometimes we see them by the hundreds, sometimes thousands <laughs> that come into the area. And we'll talk about where they come from. But they're eruptive birds, so they, they kind of come in big numbers when they, when they come, usually. And then we have the nomads, um, which are the crossbills, the red and white-winged crossbills, and we'll be talking about them. And I have some really um, neat videos of those birds to show, and I actually have a really great video that shows how they open up cones with that bill, the adaptation that they have to, to get to the cone seeds that they eat. Um, and so nomadic means they don't really um, go from one place to another and back again, like most migrant birds. They move around based on food sources. Um, so they'll travel from place to place and they can nest any time of year, depending on food sources. So they did a nesting, the red and white and crossbills at the end of the summer. And then more white winged crossbills came in at the end of October. Now they're in very large numbers and we're having a record year for red crossbills and the second best record year for white winged crossbill numbers here in central New York. Okay, so now let's talk about these birds. Um, and I've got 18 species here. I do have a couple of gulls at the beginning. I know gulls aren't terribly exciting for most people. <laughs> there are some birders that get very excited about gulls, but um, the Iceland gull, and you can see where it nests. If you take a look at the range map, you can see it's a very high 
um, up in the high Arctic bird. Um, so it's really kind of exciting to see these, these birds because there's so little known about many of these birds because of where they nest. It's really fascinating to get to see them in winter. And this, these are known as sort of the white winged gulls. Um, they don't have the black edging on their wings. Let me see if I have a few photos. This one I took down on Lake Champlain, the bird um, in the water with the black bill is an Iceland gull. And that's a ring bill gull to its right. And there it is again. And you can see it doesn't have the black tail that the ring bill gulls have. And here's another photo of the Iceland gull. And this one I took um, over at the, um, the dam at, at Messina on the St. Lawrence River, another Iceland gull over there. Hey, Joan, it's Chris here. Yes. R really quick, I wanted to see if I can move that bar that's at the top of the screen off of your screen so that people can see all the words. Um, oh, because they're you, seeing that too? Yeah. I, can you move okay. your cursor up to where the meeting controls bar is up at the top? See if it kind of appears there. Is it, are you seeing the meeting controls? No. It's not, nothing's dropping down there? No. Okay. Yeah, I didn't really see a way to take this off here. <laughs> there, is it, are you seeing some buttons there though? Do you see a I've thing that says buttons. more? Yeah more with three dots next to it. Uh-huh. Click on that for a second. Okay. And then click the one that says hide floating meeting controls. Okay. Got it. Okay. There it's Great. gone. Although there's right. one in the middle now. <laughs> oh that's nope, gone. We're, we're good. good. We're good. Yay, we got it. All right. Gonna... Thank you. <laughs> I didn't realize other people were seeing that too. I thought it was just my screen. Well it took okay. me a minute to figure it out, but we're on track. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right. And the other goal that I wanted to show was the Glaucus gull. It's a much bigger bird than the Iceland gull. Um, and again, you see that the wings, again, white edging on the wings. It's a, it's a very big gull. It's a great black back gull behind it, which is also a very large gull. Oh, I have, a, I have a vocalization. I have vocalizations for pretty much all of the birds. There we go. And then once again, you can see the glaucus bill nests very high um, up in the high Arctic. So it's exciting to see this bird in winter because again, it's a bird you don't get to see very often. Okay, I have another photo here. And this is a glaucus gull in the, in the foreground here and a herring gull below it, which is a, a, a gull that we're all a little more familiar with. But again, take a look at the difference in the tails. The wing, I'm sorry, the wing feathers. Okay, so those were the two gulls. And now um, I've got the rough-legged hawk to show you, which is a hawk that I, I absolutely love to see. And again, you can see where it nests, again, very high. Um, and But it's pretty widespread in the winter because it, it definitely comes down to open country in the winter to, to hunt. Let me play this. You don't really get to, I don't think I've ever heard them vocalize in winter, but. Um, this is what it would sound like if you were on its breeding grounds. There you go. And this is um, a light morph. Let me go on to the next slide. I can see it. See, if you take a look, you can see the under part of the bird from, from this angle, and it's got that really dark band across the belly and a couple of um, very dark blotches on the wing and, and black edging uh, at the edges of the wing and, and the tail is white edged on, on a black band. But that's a uh, light morph, rough-legged hawk. They come in two different color variations. Um, the one that you just saw was the light morph, and here's another light morph. They have a very um, kind of a frosty head. They're really a beautiful, beautiful hawk. Um, and if you want to see a lot of these, there's usually a lot of them over on Point Peninsula um, in Jefferson County. It's just uh, sometimes you can go over there and start counting and you just lose count because they're really um, pretty abundant. And they do maintain winter territories when they come down. So they stay in the same place. Here's another light morph, rough-legged hawk. And here's the rough-legged uh, dark morph variation, which is a very dark bird. Um, very dark bird. I mean, almost from a distance, sometimes you look like you think you're looking at, you know, a, a crow or something. Very, very dark bird. But it's uh, the dark morph, uh, rough legged hawk. Beautiful, beautiful birds. And they're really fun to watch um, hunt because they just hover and they don't literally don't move. They just sort of hover in the sky and they can they can see vol urine um, from a really long distance away and plummet and grab prey. And they're really uh, quite, quite remarkable birds. 
And then moving on to the owls, and I've got, um, I believe, four different owls I'm going to be showing you. The snowy owl here, which is the, the heaviest owl in North America, by the way, it's about four pounds. Um, boy, I should play its vocalizations for you. There we go. Mm. Really? And, and I mm. have heard snowy mm. owls vocalize mm. um, over in Jefferson County, where I go to see them. And I heard, heard that vocalization. Mm. And you can see that they nest, again, pretty high. They, they like open areas. They nest on the ground. They can have really large numbers of babies when there's enough food to feed them. Um, and uh, that's a male. Go down to another photo here. Beautiful, beautiful feet on these birds. Um, I once counted 12 of them in two hours over in Jefferson County, and it was really thrilling. They were interacting. Um, let me see. Here's another one here. They tend to, to perch up on telephone poles um, over in Jefferson County on rooftops of people's houses. It's really interesting to go over there and see them. This is an owl that I caught on top of a telephone pole um, coughing up an owl pellet, which you know, when they eat um, mice or voles and things, when they eat small mammals, the, they, they produce these pellets that are full of the bones of that animal that they've eaten. And then they have to spit it up. And this owl, I mean, the, the mouth opened almost 180 degrees and I was wondering what on earth it was doing and then it coughed up the owl pellet um, from the top of the telephone pole. And just beautiful, this is a beautiful male. Large, very large feet. And this bird, um, I started photographing because it kept getting bigger and bigger and it's, it looked like it was a hundred pounds. It just got, it just fluffed out till it was huge. And what was happening was there was another owl flying into its winter territory and it was upset and it was trying to look fierce. So it made itself look gigantic. Um, it's really interesting. And here was one that was sleeping over in Jefferson County in the middle of a field. Sometimes they just fall asleep in the middle of a field and they blend right in with the snow. Um, so that's snowy owls. Snowy owls are a really exciting bird to see. And again, Jefferson County is a wonderful place to see them because they're usually in, in very large numbers over there. Um, and then the northern hawk owl is another owl from the north that we sometimes get uh, down here when, when there's enough food and, and it doesn't have enough food where, where it lives, it'll, they'll drop down um, into our area. As you can see, we're just sort of at the very edge of that area where they'll drop. Hear it? I've never heard one vocalize in the winter. This owl. It's pretty fierce looking. They nest in the boreal forest. Unlike the snowy owl, which nests on the ground up in uh, open, open, open territory, in the tundra. Interesting sounds. They also set up a winter territory. And once you find one, you can pretty much watch it for the entire winter. A really beautiful bird. And I took these photos very close up to this owl. They don't care about you being around them. They just focus totally on hunting. Um, we were just a few feet from this owl and it really hardly ever even looked over at us at all. It was um, just really pretty intent on its hunting. Beautiful, beautiful owl. This uh, particular day, this bird was in Vermont and you could see it just had a meal. It's got blood all over its bill. And I took this uh, through my scope. This bird was in Potsdam and it's set up by a Walmart, um, which is really interesting because this is a, a you know, boreal forest bird um, that's uh, deep in the forest and, and yet uh, will set up right next to a Walmart. So Larry Master took this photo and uh, there's a mouse there that this owl has already decapitated that it's eating on top of a telephone pole. I took this photo of the bird um, next to the Walmart sign and it was there for the whole winter, this, this uh, Northern uh, hawk owl really kind of an interesting place. Uh, jumping to another Northern owl, the great gray owl, which is the largest by size and length and, and wingspan, but not the heaviest, it's all feathers. Um, beautiful, beautiful owl that we sometimes get here in Northern New York. Mm, 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 That's its sound. Mm, and I've mm, never heard one mm, vocalize mm, on the winter mm, grounds. Mm. You can see this bird also drops down a little bit in the western mm, side of the mm, of the mm, of the country, mm, 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 and it has a milk mustache. Mm, 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 
I would love to, to go up to the Great Gray and Northern Hawk Owl nesting grounds and hear them making their sounds because they're very interesting down here. So this bird showed up in Potsdam one winter at someone's feeder and it was just it would just sit there and, and grab the little small mammals that were attracted to the bird seed that was falling um, all around this feeder and so it would just sit on the platform and again a very tame owl um, you can walk we would rock, walk right up to it and it just didn't even care it would just focus on hunting very tame really beautiful this one I took of the one of the Messina birds a few years ago maybe some people here remember there were there were large numbers of uh, great gray owls in Messina one winter which was very exciting very beautiful this bird was, uh, showed up in Tupper Lake um, in the middle of the Adirondacks at the end of, it was March of that winter, I remember. Um, and Larry, I called him and Larry Master who studied these birds for his PhD came flying uh, really fast. To, and <laughs> I think he did his drive in half the time it should have taken um, and, and took some beautiful photos of the bird, which was only around for a couple of days before it disappeared. This is another photo that he got of that bird that was hunting in Tupper Lake. That was a few years ago. And then the fourth owl, and, and, and the birds that I star in the presentation are birds that also nest in New York. Um, this bird's uh, kind of endangered in New York at this point. Um, it's listed with the state. And so when they do find nesting areas, and I know of a few, um, they, the DEC has been keeping it quiet because the bird is um, it's in such low numbers now in New York State. But you can see that it kind of nests all across Canada and Alaska and a little bit in the northern part of our country out west and just barely in, in New York in some areas. You can hear this. And this, this owl makes some really interesting kind of barking sounds. Interesting range too. Um, it's on multiple continents, and you can see it's in South America and North America. Um, so they're they're pretty widespread. They you can see them at dusk. So uh, when you want to go and see this owl, you have to hit it right at dusk, um, right right when you're when the light is fading. Um, if you want to see it, whereas the northern hawk owl and the great gray owl that we were just talking about hunt during the day. Um, and the northern hawk owl actually even uses sight, not just sound, to hunt uh, its prey. So it, it can see the prey and it can hear them. And they, they do both of them. And, and, and the snow meal sometimes too are hunting by day. Um, but the short eared owl, you have to kind of catch at dusk because it, it does most of its hunting at night. And this is another photo that Larry Master took of a short eared owl, another one that he took. And I took this one over on Point Peninsula when they were in really large numbers just a couple of years ago. And uh, this one was just roosting by the road um, just hanging out during the day. And I took a photo, beautiful, beautiful bird. And they nest on the ground, by the way, they nest on the ground and there are some of them still nesting in New York state, which is really great. And then switching away from owls to the, um, the perching birds. And this is a Northern Shrike, which is a predatory songbird. So it doesn't have talons, but it uses that very sharp bill to kill other birds um, and mammals. And we play because it's really interesting sounds. The northern strike makes. I have heard the northern strike um, vocalize like this when it comes in in October. It usually starts showing up in October in northern New York. Uh, and also um, in April, right as it's getting ready to leave to go back up um, to the, the, the Arctic, <laughs> the northern places where it nests. Um, it will vocalize. So it vocalizes coming in and it vocalizes when it's leaving, but not so much um, in, the, in the middle of that. And it does set up a territory also. And it picks a territory very similar to where it nests. So it looks for kind of fields with shrubs and some tall trees nearby. So it will, it will hunt from the trees. And then once it gets prey, it goes into the shrubs and disappears to eat the prey. Um, this is an, uh, an adult northern shrike. It's got the black mask, very sharp bill. And this is a juvenile, so they're kind of brownish, but you can still kind of make out the black mask developing there in the juvenile space. And uh, Larry Master uh, released a mouse uh, to <laughs> a northern shrike um, in winter, and it got a really great series of photographs so that you can see actually how it, how it kills its prey. So it's, it's grabbing hold of the mouse there. The mouse is fighting, um, still fighting it. And so the northern shrike goes in for the kill and it tries to get uh, its prey by the back of the neck, which it did here with the mouse. 
and then carries it off. Um, I actually had one a uh, couple of years ago now. I had a white breasted nuthatch at my feeders and uh, I went outside to get in my car and all the birds were acting really strange. And this white breasted nuthatch looked really upset and flew into a tree in front of me. And a Northern Shrike came in and grabbed it and, it, and the poor white breasted nuthatch was just screaming as it was carried off. It was really awful. Um, so they're, they're, they're very quick, um, the Northern Shrikes when they're, when they're in kill mode. Um, so there it is carrying off that little mouse. Um, and by the way, just uh, one other note about the northern shrike, which I think is interesting, is they they the male will impale its prey um, on a, in a hawthorn tree or some kind of a, a, a pricker bush, and then sit at the top of that tree or bush and sing to attract a female by showing that it's a good provider, um, by showing all of its food that it captures. So it'll just kind of impale them to kind of attract a female during the mating season. Interesting bird. Bohemian waxwing is that bird I, I told you just kind of made a big movement into our area in the past week, and it's just a great bird for people to see. Um, we get a lot of people that travel to our area to see this bird because it's tough to see it. It's, it's As you can see, it nests pretty high up in the northwestern North America and Alaska. So a lot of people uh, who are birders, pretty serious birders, often haven't seen this particular species, so they'll, they'll travel to our area to see it. And um, I've got a couple of photos to show you the difference between the bohemian waxwing and the cedar waxwing. There are only three waxwing species in the world. There's a Japanese waxwing. And then we have the cedar waxwing as a breeding bird and the bohemian waxwing as a visitor in winter. But we also often have cedar waxwings in winter too. And we have all this winter. So here's what the bohemian waxwing sounds like. It's a very loud rolling trill. And usually you get large numbers of these birds in flocks in winter. And sometimes um, I used to get flocks of 700 behind our house in Potsdam when we were over there in St. Lawrence County. Um, and it's pretty intense when you have, you know, 700 making the sound. Um, it's a loud, continuous rolling trill. The cedar waxwing, on the other hand, kind of um, just like a, a couple of notes. So not the rolling trill that the bohemian waxwing has. So sometimes you'll see a tree that'll be full of a hundred cedar waxwings and there might be one or two bohemians and you'll hear the bohemian waxwing voice over the cedar waxwing voice um, because it's much louder. So the, the bohemian waxwing is a little bit larger. It has this uh, russet undertail and very colorful wings, very pretty and a little bit larger than the cedar waxwing. If you're looking up at the cedar waxwing, see it's got a white undertail pattern and a little bit of yellow and less colorful wings than the bohemian waxwing, it's a bit smaller. So that's how you can tell them apart. But usually the, the, the thing that you can look at really quickly if you're looking up at the birds in a tree is that undertail. Uh, the russet color is what you look for for the bohemian waxwing. And here's, <laughs> they have some pretty wild um, feathers on top of their head. Uh, here's another bohemian here. Here's a bohemian waxwing. Um, I took, uh, I think the other photo I took in Nuke, and this one I took in Long Lake. And this is a bohemian waxwing eating uh, the fruit of a crabapple tree. And again, they come in for fruit. They love buckthorn berries, which is an invasive, um, invasive plant that's pretty much everywhere because you get you know, 700 bohemian waxwings eating buckthorn berries and they're gonna spread that, uh, the seeds of that bush. And it's almost impossible to get rid of buckthorn. And this one I took, this I took in Newcomb um, at the Overlook. And that's a, those are big apples that those bohemian waxwings were eating. Very beautiful bird and fun to see. And pretty tame. You can walk right up to the flocks when they're eating and they don't fly away. Uh, moving on to the finches. This is uh, a pine grosbeak, beautiful male bird. Um, and I'll show you the female in a minute. Oh, play the scoop with a beautiful voice. And they nest not too far to, to our north. Um, if you've been to Cape Breton, they're there. Uh, we went to the Bethel Peninsula a couple of years ago and they. They're up there nesting, and so you'll, you'll hear them. They like kind of open coniferous forests in Canada, and, and they are actually even a Western bird in the United States in the mountain regions. Very distinctive voice. I've only encountered two so far this winter down in the uh, Lake Champlain Valley in Willsboro to fly over birds that were vocalizing. Okay, I'll move down. This, so this is a male, uh, very, very beautiful birds. Oh, this is a video. 
I happened to be driving on Sabbath Road. This is a, a, a particularly a year that they were not, they did not erupt, but I happened upon two males on Sabbath Circle Road gridding, and finches do that to help them digest their seed diet. And so these two males were gridding in a snowstorm. So I was, I think I took that through a windshield. <laughs> really beautiful. And here's the female. So she's kind of a, a greenish yellow color. So she's not the vibrant red of the, of the male. It's another image of a female. This was in Mount Pelier. It's a funny story behind this that I won't have time to tell, but um, anyway. Mount Pelier. This was on the day of the um, the women's march um, during the, the Trump inauguration, by the way. <laughs> so really, anyway, um, so this was Mount Pelier where they erupted. And this is often the case that the pine grosbeaks end up in towns or like really large towns. Um, and you can walk right up to them. They're super tame. In Newfoundland, they call them mopes. Um, they're adorable. They sit really close together on branches. They You can literally walk up to them. I mean, they can be eating like berries at your feet. Um, they they're completely tame birds, totally different from evening grosbeaks, which are kind of more aggressive and like their personal space. But pine grosbeaks are very sweet birds. Um, and I love to see them, one of my favorites. And this is switching uh, to another finch now is the red cross bill that was the, on, the, on the cover. Um, let me play that for you so you can hear the vocalization. That's a song. And they are singing right now because they're nesting. And you can see this bird uh, nests in Mexico and Central America and the western part of the of the United States, and also up north in the boreal forest. So it's um, it's not uh, considered strictly a boreal bird because it, it does nest in other places than the boreal forest of, of Canada. Um, and we get this bird pretty much pretty much every year. We didn't last year because we didn't have any cones. We had no cone crop, but this year we've got. A tremendous cone crop, and pretty much every time something has a good cone crop, one of the the uh, and I and I do an evaluation for an ornithologist in Canada every year. So I give him, I have to evaluate every tree, every coniferous tree, every deciduous tree, um, and the food crop, and I get that report out uh, toward the end of the summer, and then the ornithologist in Canada pieces together from all these reports that he gets from the northern states and all the provinces in Canada what these birds are going to do. Um, you know, which, which birds will come south, uh, which birds won't come south based on food sources that they have up there. So it's a, it's a really complicated puzzle that they kind of put together, but pretty much every year something has a good cone crop here. Um, and we, we tend to have red cross bills almost every year nesting in some, in some level of numbers. Uh, this year we have them nesting in huge numbers all across central, the central Adirondacks and southern Adirondacks, they're in gigantic numbers this year. And it looks like a record year for nesting red cross bills. And they make a kind of a, their call note is kind of a, um, and the sort of a complicated story with, with red cross bills, there's probably, they think, I don't know, 11 or 12 different species. They all look alike, um, but they have different calls and different songs. So um, at Cornell, they can actually type them. And we tend to have type 10 cross bills here in, in Northern New York. And so they can kind of try to tell apart the different species and how they'll ever do that uh, formally. I don't know, because they all kind of look alike. Um, so it's a it's kind of a complicated story for this particular bird. Here's the female, and it's kind of a green yellow, and they have these crossed bills. So the lower mandible either crosses to the left or the right, and it's really interesting because when they grit, they have to turn their head, and they turn their head in the direction that the lower mandible points. Um, and you'll see this, um, and they have to drink turning their head too because of this crossed bill situation. It's an adaptation for opening cones that you'll see in just a minute. Here's a male and female together. And unfortunately, they do a lot of this. Um, they grit in the roadways and they get hit by cars. They don't fly up in time um, to get out of the way, but they also don't get squished. So what happens is they fly up very last minute. So they hit the underside of the car or they get hit by the, the grill in the front of the car and they get knocked and, and usually you know, it kills them. Um, so they're intact. So people collect them for museums and universities um, because they don't actually get squished, but they get killed. And they get killed in, in, in I, I see them dead, I would say every couple of days, I, I find a dead one just driving around. And, and I drive very slowly <laughs> because all these crossbills are nesting and they're always in the roadways. Uh, they spend a lot of time gridding. So, um, and they look like pieces of dirt sometimes just because they're kind of hunched down. Uh, here's a, a male and you can see the, the crossed bill. 
And this is really cute. I caught this at the Boreas River on Route 28N uh, in Minerva. And this is mate feeding and they do a lot of this. So uh, the male is feeding the female and that's a courtship um, that goes on. So the male can feed the female when she's on the nest and show that he's a good provider. And here is a defensive uh, position that a red cross bill was doing when another red cross bill was coming into its area. Uh, but they do nest in groups um, and they do nest near each other uh, in, in large groups. And, and the red cross bills and the white winged cross bills nest near each other also. And they grit together. Here's a, a group gritting in the road and there's a baby in the middle. It looks like a big pine siskin, but that's a, a baby uh, red cross bill. Here's another male female, another male bird. And here's a video where you can see. So this bird's lower mandible points to the right and the bird is turning its head to the right to grit. So I can actually tell based on the way the bird turns its head, which way the bill um, points. Uh, just basically, because it's 50-50, by the way. With red cross bills, 50% of the birds have a lower mandible that crosses to the left, and 50% have a lower mandible that crosses to the right. Um, in the white wing cross bill, it's 75-25, and they, do, they, don't know, they don't know the mechanism for how the bill crosses. They've studied it, and they still don't know, um, and, and or why the differences in the, in the percentages between the two different species, why that is. Okay, and here's a video. This is a, a crossbill uh, feeding on, I think, believe it looks like red spruce. Could be white spruce. I can't really see the cones that clearly. They, they love uh, all the different cones, really. I've seen them feeding in you know, red pine, white pine, uh, tamarack, and all the spruces and balsam fir. Let me go on to the next one. This is a little more, a little closer. This is a tamarack. And in a minute, you're going to see uh, with the white and cross bill exactly how they do this with that bill, like what, how they're using that adaptation of the crossed bill to push the scales apart and then use their tongue to grab the seed. And here's another one. And often they pick the cone, they'll pick the cone right off and then hold it in their foot. So you'll see them carrying cones around. <laughs> Sometimes they'll just pick a cone and then go somewhere else and, and, and feed on that cone. Red-eyed vireo singing in the background because this was a summer nesting that went on here. So again, the red and white and cross bills nested in late summer and now they're doing a winter nesting. This was on the Blue Ridge Road, not too far from Elk Lake where Margo um, has her uh, lovely um, uh, Elf Lake Lodge, <laughs> anyway, right down the road from that. And here are some more crossbills um, gritting in the road, a couple of males and four females there. And here's some fledglings. Um, these birds, I, I was actually looking at some crossbills that were across the road and I heard something above my head. And I looked up and I had to back up to photograph these, there were two babies up, up above me and they were just looking down at me, um, completely tame. They just, they were like a couple of feet away, very, very cute. And we should be seeing babies any, well, uh, probably by the end of March, beginning of April, we should start to see the babies from both, both the red crossbills and white wing crossbills. Speaking of white wing crossbills, here's the male. And I don't know if you notice the difference. Um, I, should, I should put pictures side by side, but the white wing crossbill is a pink red and it's got the white wing bars. Whereas the red crossbill, if you noticed, was an orangey red. It was like a brick kind of um, orange red. And the white wing crossbill is a pink red. Okay, say that. And it has a much longer song. Very pretty. The other day there was a white wing cross bill up in a tree on the Tahaz Road in Newcomb next to a red cross bill male. And they were both singing a uh, one tree apart. Um, it was really beautiful. So they nest near each other, the two different species. And take a look at the range map here. This is this this is a boreal bird. So the white-winged crossbill nests in the boreal forest, and we're lucky sometimes when we have good cone crops, and maybe their cone crop isn't quite that good, or maybe some of them just make their way down anyway. But I'm I'm assuming that the cone crop isn't that good to the north because we've got really pretty large numbers of white-winged crossbills nesting in northern New York this year. Here's the male, and there's the female down below, 
and she's got uh, the two wing bars also. And she's the same color as the, the red crossbill female, kind of a, a greenish yellow. And here is a young male, uh, white wing crossbill on Savada Circle Road in Long Lake. And here's a video. This is along Savannah's Road. Um, this is a male white wing crossbill singing way up at the top of a dead snag. When they sing, they're usually pretty high like this or the top of a conifer at the very, very top, which frustrates the photographers because they want to get photos. So <laughs> I always tell them to wait till they're going to start gritting because when they start to come down, they'll come down lower and lower in the tree uh, at the edge of the road to grit in the road. Um, and, and usually you can get eye level vantage points as they're making their way lower to get into the road to, to grit. And they do a lot of drinking too, um, cross bills. So now I'm gonna um, transition, so, and just to follow up on that, so um, so where you would look for them is they, they like conifers, but they like wet areas. So the cross bill, white wing cross bills are usually nesting in marshes, around marshes, around bogs, um, areas where there might be a river or a brook, um, anywhere where they can get to water, because both, both species spend a lot of time drinking and a lot of time gritting in the roads. Um, this is a wonderful video that Cornell did that shows you, and I'll let it speak, how they how they use that bill to eat. Of the 10,000 bird species on Earth, only five, all in the finch family, have crossed bills. The white-winged crossbill is found in the higher latitudes of North America, traveling from coast to coast in large flocks in search of white spruce trees. Females are greenish yellow, males red, and both have two distinct white bars on the wings. Their unique crossed bill, with the lower mandible curving under the upper maxilla, is adapted to reach heavily protected seeds found under tough cone scales. To reach the seeds, a white wing places the tip of the curved lower mandible against the cone while inserting the upper maxilla under the scale. Beak partially open, the bird uses the curved mandible as a lever, twisting his head as he pries up the scale. He eats the seed, discarding the husk. The curve of the mandible provides the leverage needed to force the scale up, enabling crossbills to feed on seeds that are not accessible to other species. A white wing often twists the cone off and carries it to a perch where it holds the cone in one claw and rotates it like a corn cob. Lower mandibles cross either left or right, and each individual always holds the cone in the claw toward which their mandible curves. This ensures that the tip of the mandible is facing the cone, giving the bird the best leverage to quickly pluck the seeds. White wings are remarkably efficient at harvesting their food. An individual bird can eat up to 3,000 seeds per day. Crossbills are able to swiftly bypass a conifer's armor as a direct result of their specialized beaks, an excellent example of evolutionary adaptation. Thanks to the Cornell lab for that wonderful up close uh, view of, of, of how those birds are, are getting into those cones. Um, it's re really remarkable. And, and one of the things that they, they talked about in that video, um, they do favor white spruce. So areas where we have white spruce and we've got, uh, especially um, along um, Sabatis Road and Tahaz Road and the Blue Ridge Road here in the central Adirondacks, there's a lot of white spruce. So those areas always get white wing cross bills when, when they erupt. Um, so you can kind of look in particular because we've got black spruce, red spruce, and white spruce, and Norway spruce, of course. Um, I'm not a native tree, but so we've got we've got all these different spruces, but they in particular really like the white white spruce. Moving to a different finch now, the common red pole. And this is a male that you're seeing on the screen here. Let me play their vocalization. This again is a bird that used to have an every other year eruption schedule, but has 
changed. Um, it's been changed like for the last eight years with the with the climate shifting. Um, but they have made a move into our area in the past week, so people are starting to get them at their feeders. Oops, Let me click that button. You can hear it. Oops. They use that black fin as um, a threat to other birds. So when they want to intimidate another bird, they lift their bill, put their head up in the air, to flash their, their black chin. And you can see this is a bird of, of the, the taiga and tundra um, up there. And, and we get uh, movements of this bird to the south when they don't have enough food. Uh, usually birch catkins is their favorite food. There we go. There's a female and she doesn't have the, the red chest. Oops. There's the, the red chested male and there's the female and she doesn't have the, the red chest on her. Um, here is a video of the red pole snowbirding. I've been um, videotaping that for over 20 years um, when I've had large numbers of them here at my house. Um, this is an old lean to on our property and this is a, probably a 20 year old video that I had. Um, I looked out one day and there were a couple of dozen uh, red poles that just sort of popped up out of the snow on the lean-to roof. And I was amazed by that and became obsessed with it. And I've, I have hours and hours of video of this behavior. Um, and it's something that they do uh, only for a few seconds usually. They make these little burrows right under the very surface of the snow. They don't go deep. They make little tunnels. Sometimes they'll tunnel for a while. But the most I've ever seen them in these things is maybe a minute or two. They, um, they don't spend much time in them. And no one seems to know why they do this. Um, I've had a million theories, all of which I've thrown out over time, but uh, it's a really fascinating thing to watch. So there you can see some birds under the snow. Those are all birds right there in their little burrows that they're, <laughs> they're digging. And they dig with their head. They get a foothold and then they just kind of use their head um, to kind of, and their feet to kind of kick the snow. And they fight over these things. It's a very social behavior. Um, they can hear each other so that somebody will give a message for everybody to fly. And maybe there's a couple dozen under the snow and they all pop out at exactly the same moment. There's a couple of fights over that particular burrow there. Um, so there's one in a little burrow and it's trying to hang on to it, but somebody's going to come and evict it. So um, very perplexing. There's no food in there. Is there no, and, and they do it on the ground too. This is ground snow, usually uh, some kind of slanted snow where they can get a foothold and then use their head to kind of dig with their head. And it's a very, very common behavior with the right snow conditions. I would see this every single day at my house. Um, there is a, a, a myth that they do this overnight. They don't do that. And, a, and an ornithologist in Europe actually documented that and found that they die within an hour of being under the snow. They really couldn't do that because any kind of snowfall would kill them. They're so tiny. I, they, they, they roost in trees like other birds. It's just that they are so used to um, dark conditions because of the Arctic that they're, uh, they're the first light birds. I mean, they're, when you have feeders, they're the first birds that will hit your feeder and almost in total darkness in the morning, they'll be the first ones there. So when people see them snow burrowing early in the morning, they think maybe they've spent the night under there, but they, they don't, they, and they don't spend much time under the snow either. Um, one year I had an aberrantly, um, two aberrantly plumaged uh, common red poles when we were in Potsdam. This particular red pole didn't have the, the lines that should be going all the way down the sides. Um, it was cut off, so it was white. So I could tell that this bird was always in a flock of 70 birds. And there it is, it's very white, it kind of stood out. And it had a white um, rump, which usually indicates hoary red pole, but it wasn't a hoary red pole. It was just an aberrantly plumaged common red pole. And then this was the second one I had, and I called this the puffin pole. It had a white cheek and uh, orange legs. So it was <laughs> completely different. And it really stood out in the crowd here. You can see it there sticking out, looking very different. And so these two birds uh, allowed me to see that the, the flocks were the same size all winter long. And uh, that's been kind of a mystery is where these winter flocks actually form. Do they form on the breeding grounds up in the Arctic and then come down together? Do they form on the way? Do they form when they get down here? It's kind of interesting to you know wonder where these winter flocks that are pretty consistently the same size, where they actually form. This is a hoary red pole. And as far as I've heard recently, I think they're gonna put them back together. I, I think they're gonna combine 
the hoary redpoll and common rural, even though they look pretty different. Um, this is a bird that nests much higher. It's much higher up in the Arctic than the common redpoll, very white. Let me show you some, some comparisons here. This is uh, one of Larry Masters' photos. The bird on the left is the common redpoll and the bird on the right is a hoary redpoll. They have a shorter bill. Their eye looks closer to their bill. They have kind of a hunched back. Um, they're very white and have very fine streaks on their sides. Here's a photo I took um, many years ago. There's a hoary red bull on the right. Again, a small bill and the eye is close to the bill and it's kind of got a hunchback appearance. A little larger looking than a common red bull on the left. Um, this is a video and I'll just show the beginning of this one. Uh, this was, um, uh, the front porch was covered with snow and ice and some seeds. And so there was a flock of Red poles and siskins and this hoary red pole, which just really stood out. It looked larger than you know the common red poles around it. And you can really tell when you have a hoary red pole that it's quite different from the other birds. And I'm gonna to move to the second video. And this one shows the rump. So they tend to hold their wings because they're a little chunkier and bulkier, they tend to hold their wings out and you can actually see their white rump. Um, the other common red poles have a streaked rump. This is a very sought after bird by birders. It's, it's hard to see a hoary red pole. Usually you have to have about a hundred common red poles to get one hoary red pole in the mix. Um, so when I would have flocks of, you know, three to 500 red poles at my feeders, I would usually get two or three hoary red poles mixed in. Um, and that's a, a very, very sought after bird for people to see, tough one to see. And this is the pine siskin, and I have this one starred because this is also a nesting bird. You can see the, the purple over the Adirondacks. Um, this bird nests in the Adirondacks, um, and it's also a Western bird, as you can see the purple out West and also down into Mexico. So uh, let me play that vocalization for you. These birds um, have been in pretty big numbers this winter, so you might have been seeing them. They're hanging out with the crossbills. They're hanging out with both inches of feeders. Um, lots of people have them at their feeders. They're a streaky bird with a little bit of yellow on their wing. Very chatty. And they're known for mate feeding, which is adorable. So you see mate feeding year round in this species. Very cute. And they're very loyal. Um, I think some interesting things happen when birds die um, and the different reactions that birds have to that. But when pine siskins get hit in the road from breeding, um, sometimes their flock will form like a circle around the dead bird and just, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what they're doing to react, but they definitely are reacting to the fact that, you know, somebody's down and not moving. Um, and I had a pair of pine siskins one April, um, they had been around at my winter feeders and this pair was on my front lawn and a red squirrel got one of them. A red squirrel is the largest predator of birds in the Adirondacks. They eat, you know, birds if they can grab them. That's why feeder birds will be very careful around red squirrels. They predate nests, they get in nest holes and woodpeckers. Um, they're very dangerous to the birds and it caught one of them uh, and the mate spent the entire afternoon on my front lawn looking for its partner, which it was confused that it lost. Um, it was very sad. So they seem to have a kind of a mourning. I, I don't know how to, I, and see a human term, but um, they definitely react to death and, um, and, and react for quite some time. So here's one, uh, it's, a, it's a blurry photo, but I put it in because it had a very yellow wing. Sometimes you, you catch pine siskins that have just a lot of yellow on their wing because that usually isn't the case. It's usually looking more like this bird at a feeder here. They're a little subdued yellow, but the other one was bright yellow. And the last finch that I want to cover was evening grosbeak. And I have a star there, but I have not found a nesting evening grosbeak in years now. Um, I would say the middle of this past decade, they just, they left one winter and didn't come back to nest. So we do still get some here and there now in winter. We used to get really big numbers in winter at feeders. Um, and now it's getting less and less every year. And I have not found a, a nesting one. And I used to have them bring their young to my feeders when I would feed in the summer. So it's kind of sad um, that we seem to be losing numbers for this bird, at least here in the East. Very loud, um, <laughs> very different from the pine grosbeak. sheep. They like their space. Uh, they're not super tame um, and they they don't like other birds around them. They don't sit close to each other like the pine grosbeak. sheep. They're totally different personality. Super loud. That's a male, very yellow, looks like a parrot. And here's the female. 
She's uh, not quite as brightly colored yellow. Here's another male. And this is a feeder um, along Kickerville Road in Long Lake. Someone's feeder that was getting evening roast beets years ago when they <laughs> used to be here in bigger numbers. So that's the end of the finches. And then I have the, the, the snow bunting, uh, which is just the cutest bird. I love to see this bird. Um, people in the valleys see more of them than we do here in the Adirondacks, but down in Lake Champlain and St. Lawrence Valleys. But we do get some, and there has been some in Newcomb uh, pretty much all winter. And they're really adorable. They make wonderful sounds. They nest way up, way up. And their nest, uh, where they nest is in rock crevasses. <laughs> up in the Arctic. And the males go back at the beginning of April, four to six weeks ahead of the females because there's very limited rock crevasses in the Arctic and they have to grab um, a good nesting area, but they go back and it can be, you know, 20 to 30 below zero still when they go back up at the beginning of April. Um, but they go up way ahead of the female. Once you hear their voice, it's really cute. Thank you for beautiful twittering noises. And you can see them in big flocks in the valleys. You usually see them in smaller numbers here in the Adirondacks. Very pretty sounds. And here's a photo of one I took along Sabata Circle Road up on a wire. Interesting claw that they have too. And here's a flock um, that I took over on Point Peninsula. Again, uh, the valley, the St. Lawrence Valley. So in the valleys, you find these giant, giant flocks of them together. Um, this one came to visit. I was feeding wild turkeys here some corn and this one showed up and it was around for a couple of days uh, eating the corn, lovely bird. Um, the video. So it's eating corn, cracked corn. I noticed that it was reacting to the blue jay that was calling in the background and it, it occurred to me it probably doesn't know much about blue jays but again, <laughs> every time a blue jay would vocalize over it it would you know look look up and look a little nervous so that's a, a a beautiful snow bunting it's a great bird and the last bird that I want to talk about was the American tree sparrow. Um, again, a, a little more abundant in the valleys at people's feeders at Lake Champlain and the St. Lawrence Valley, but they, they, you can find some here and there um, in the Adirondacks too, but the numbers are larger in the valley areas. This is a, a bird with a bicolored bill. So the bottom is yellow, and then it's got that black spot on its chest. And you can see this bird comes down from uh, upper Canada, northern Canada and Alaska in the winter. And even though it says American tree sparrow, that's um, uh, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a bird of the trees. It's a, it's a ground bird like most sparrows. Um, kind of misnamed. So there you can see the bicolored bill. And the spot there. So that's a sparrow that visits feeder areas. So if you're down in the valleys, you probably get this bird at your feeders. Okay, so that was the, the 18 species. And again, I didn't cover all of them. There's, there's quite a few more, um, but I wanted to kind of hit the major ones that people kind of look for in winter. And now we can talk very briefly about where, where do we go to see these? So in the open country of the St. Lawrence Valley, the Lake Champlain Valley and the nor northern, um, north of the Adirondacks, um, between the, the Adirondack Park and, and Canada, or you can look for these birds. So rough-legged hawks, um, short-eared owls. There's some really known locations where you can go and see them. And again, you have to hit that one right at dusk. You have to really time that one. Um, snowy owls, uh, lots of them in Jefferson County. Uh, Northern shrikes. We do get Northern shrikes in, in the Adirondacks too. Um, uh, more often in the valleys, I would say, than, than in the Adirondack mountain areas. Um, American tree sparrows at feeders usually and snow buntings you can see in very large numbers down in the valleys. Um, in the valleys and the Adirondacks, um, you can encounter the great gray owl, northern hawk owl, and again, they'll, they'll set up a winter territory and stay in the same area. The bohemian waxwings love the fruit trees, so I think I know where almost every fruit tree is 
in North New York, because this is a really sought after bird. So after a while, you get to know like exactly where the fruit trees are that these birds love. Um, there, they can be in really big numbers in the St. Lawrence in St. Lawrence County. Um, you know, you can see them in the hundreds and hundreds feeding on buckthorn berries, which is a pretty uh, widespread um, uh, tree. <laughs> I guess you could call it a tree, bush tree. Um, and the pine grosbeak again loves fruit trees, um, mountain ash, conifer seeds. Uh, this year hasn't been a big year for them, but I, you know, given what happened in the past week, who knows? Um, the Bohemian waxwings and common red poles just suddenly appeared, you know, in, in bigger numbers in this past week. Uh, common and hoary red poles can be in the valleys and the Adirondack Mountains, and the evening grosbeaks speaks also with large, used to be large flocks in the Adirondack, but not, not so much anymore. And in the Adirondacks itself, in the mountain coniferous areas, the red crossbill, white wing crossbill, and pine siskin are pretty abundant here. And that's the Boreas River uh, along Route 28 N in the river. And as far as the gulls go, you you know you you look for open water and for and ducks and things too. We we often have the tufted duck, which is a, a really rare duck to see on Lake Champlain. Pretty much every year now, there's open water on Lake Champlain every year where that used to be uh, uncommon. Now it's the common thing. So Lake Ontario, St. Lawrence River, Lake Champlain, open water areas, you can find these kind of rare gulls and uh, waterfowl in the winter time. That, um, I think I took that, I, I think I took that photo from Point Peninsula. And where do you know what's going on? You can check online sightings. The, there's a listserv, there's Northern New York Birds listserv. There's eBird where you can check where people put their records. Um, there's all kinds of Facebook pages. There's an Adirondack Birds Facebook page. Um, there's all different kinds of ways to find uh, what people are seeing. In the old days, uh, you know, I don't know, 30 years ago, I guess, the birders would call each other. Um, and then all of a sudden there were listservs and that kind of grouped people up. And now there's message text alerts and there's eBird alerts and there's all kinds of um, all kinds of ways to find out what people are seeing and what birds are out there. So it's a lot easier to find out what people are seeing now than it was uh, a long time ago. And that's Bird's Bog, by the way, in winter. That's a, the trail to Bird's Bog in the Racket Lake area. And uh, kind of ending with this, we had an extremely rare visitor in 2017 in Tupper Lake. This is a uh, juvenile Ross's gull from Siberia. Um, every now and then, one of these birds will drop into the lower 48, and that year two did. One was in California, and there were a couple hundred birders watching it, and a pair of falcon came in and ate it, <laughs> grabbed it, and killed it in front of a whole lot of people. And two days later, this bird was discovered in Tupper Lake um, in the Adirondacks. Probably, I guess it might be the rarest bird we've ever had that I can think of anyway. Um, and that really became wild for about nine days. All the, the hotels filled with people from all over the country and people fly for this bird. I mean, this is a bird that people travel to Alaska. I think it's the first week in October every year, someplace where they are known to migrate through from one part from Siberia to another part of the Arctic in winter. And there's people that I know, I, I met someone um, that I was guiding this year from Georgia, and he's gone six times to Alaska to try to see the Ross's gull and has missed it um, every single time. And I told him about this bird and he didn't know about it and he was upset. So <laughs> I could have come to Tupper Lake. Um, it was around for nine days and brought people from really all over. Uh, quite remarkable and it was very easily seen too. It was always near the edge of the water and people had really great views of this bird. It's a cute little tiny, um, it usually has a pink belly, but this is a juvenile, so it didn't, but the adult has a pink belly and it's a very small gull, very cute. Okay, and so enjoy the winter visitors from the North because we have a lot of them right now. It's a, It's been a great winter with a great great food sources for the birds. So. Uh, it's been a, a good good winter, and, and that's why I wanted to give this presentation because it's uh, it's a very good winter to see all of these birds. Okay, uh, had to hit escape. Joan, that's a uh, that was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Stop sharing. I'll echo. <laughs> I think I did echo that. What someone else said in the chat that your knowledge is encyclopedic. Encyclopedic of all this <laughs> stuff. It's uh, it's great to have you. Um, and let me just jump to a couple of questions in the chat, if you don't mind taking a couple. Is that all right? No, no, it's fun. Yeah. Okay. And I think this first one may have been answered. Suzanne asked it earlier about where would be the best chance of seeing a snowy owl. I think you mentioned that, you know, open country is kind of your, your best bet. 
for maybe a so, snowy owl or where, where I find them every every year without fail. Um, I think it's Route 12 E. I think it is. It's that road that runs all along the top of Lake Ontario over towards the river. Because uh, Lake Ontario empties into the St. Lawrence River and there's that road that runs sort of right along uh, all the peninsulas because there's a whole bunch of peninsulas that stick down into Lake Ontario um, mm -hmm. and 12E. So once you get to Chameau-ish area, it's called Chameau, um, you start looking at the, the telephone poles because <laughs> it can be anywhere along there and sometimes in huge numbers. And then um, Point Peninsula, out on Point Peninsula, there's almost always several or more uh, snowy owls. And then some of the side roads. So you can, you know, kind of just check uh, records and things. But I think there's been quite a few seen. And and I, I don't I don't think I've ever missed Snowy Owl by going over to Jefferson County. You know? And I think there's been some, there's usually a lot in Addison County too, in Vermont, right across the bridge. A lot of people go over there. And there's been a few cited in uh, the Lake Champlain Valley too this year. But Jefferson County, you can't beat <laughs> for some of these winter birds. I, I really love that county. It sounds like it, yeah the habitat just the right right spot and rough um, like rocks if you let and shrikes and all the kind of really neat birds from the north you can see in jefferson County. yep uh ellen asked what has happened to the evening gross beaks she used to see you know so many of them 30 plus years ago yeah um i haven't been birding that long i've been birding for 22 years and just in the time that i've been birding they're just going down 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 um for a while there were some really big flocks we could still find in winter but even that seems to be diminishing now um and then the number of number of towns where they would come every winter is kind of also going down so the numbers are going down um I, you can still find them here and there but it's just not like it used to be where you'd get flocks of 200 <laughs> at your feeder. Uh, I used to feed, oh my goodness, yeah. And they call them flying pigs because they eat a ton of seed. And so when you have a flock of, you know, one or 200 of those birds, you're going to go through a lot of seed. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, those days seem to be gone, which is really sad. So I don't know what's happening to them in the East, why that change is taking place. I don't know if it's the same case out West, but um, the numbers were always a little odd in the East, but um, they, they were quite good for a while. And now they're not so good anymore. Um, the, this was from JM, probably a good question in light of all the discussion we've been having in the Adirondacks about road salt. He asked us, uh, or he or she, I'm sorry, do, does road salt affect birds gridding? Um, what kind of impacts do we know about road salt on gridding? That I don't know, because I know they're looking for the grit in particular and whether the salt is mixed with that, I, or if they just grab the grit. I mean, they know what they need to get, you know, right. um, because it, they do it all the time to help their digestion. So, yeah, I don't know if the salt would affect them. That I don't know. Okay. Um, and then an, another question was about snow fleas. Do birds eat snow fleas? And um, this was in light of the, I think it was the video or the or of the burrowing red poles. Um, I don't know. Do birds eat snow fleas? See, I had, I, I had all those theories. <laughs> Snow fleas, of course, you see, I, I love snow fleas, <laughs> I love yeah, cool. spring tails. Um, and you see them usually when the ground at the snow level is 32 degrees or more. So you, you see them, you know, they used to be a sign of spring, but now we see them all winter long because we keep getting warm days. Um, and so they're, they're there. Um, but the red poles, you know, they burrow all the time. They burrow when it's 30 below and they burrow, you know, so they're not they're not eating snow. They don't seem to be eating anything when they, when they snow burr. I don't see any sign that they're eating anything. They're just right under the very top layer of the snow. And I've never seen any evidence that they were eating. Um, and they, like I said, they do it, they do it on any kind of day, a warm day, cold day, anytime they have the right conditions for snow, um, they, they're burrowing. So I've never seen them eat that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that would be much of a meal for any bird because they're <laughs> so, so, you have so, to eat so many of them, right? You I have mean, to eat a lot so of them. <laughs> I've never, I've never witnessed a bird eating snow fleas, so I don't know if they get eaten by anything, but, um, but there are a lot of snow fleas. Yeah. <laughs> here was, uh, uh, and then we'll wind it down here, but um, could the different looking common red poles be a possible hybrid or might more likely a genetic mutation? I think they're just some kind of a mutation. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think it's a hybrid. No, I just think they were 
I know that you get different birds every now and then like that, um, where they just are a different color or they're different. <laughs> it's just something happens. And, and I don't know how that happens. But that particular year, I had two aberrant red poles, which was strange. And I don't think I've ever seen any others since then. But just that particular winter, there were two. So interesting. Um, I, I don't know if you, you probably haven't seen it yet, but I'll, I'll make sure I share it with you. But a lot of folks in the chat uh, extending their thank yous to you for uh, a wonderful, interesting, fascinating presentation. And I'd like to do the same, Joan. Thank you oh, thank so you. much for doing this once again for us. Um, it was spectacular. And I would ask folks that, um, you know, if you want to learn more about, um, you know, Joan, um, check out those links that I posted in the chat. I'll do it one more time before um, we leave tonight. You can follow her on Facebook. You can check out her website, which is AdirondackAvianExpeditions.com and uh, learn some more about all she's doing. And uh, you were telling me before, Joan, that you've got an in-person, finally, uh, now that we're kind of starting to do some more things in person, in-person uh, program coming up in the summer in August, it sounds like. Yes, it's at Grant Cottage off exit 16 of the Northway. Um, and I believe it's going to be outside which is great. So I think that's one of the reasons they were, they felt comfortable with a couple, they're doing a couple of their presentations in person. One's a musical group and, one, and I'm doing a birding one and they're going to hold it outside. So, um, and hopefully things will be, I don't know, it's hard to predict with COVID what will happen uh, down the road, but um, yeah, it's been Zoom, like you said, Zoom since we started. So this yep. will be my first in person in a very long time. Yeah. Well, we'd, we'd love to have you back in person sometime here too. I know <laughs> that may, we'll make that a goal. Uh, so thank you once again, Joan, for a great program. Wonderful help, wonderful to have you with us. Um, and just the interactivity of it was awesome too. Photos, the videos, the sounds, uh, you put so much work into it. So thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank, thank you. And thanks thank for everybody for spending your evening and hopefully you all got to eat dinner <laughs> before the big storm starts. Right. <laughs> Uh, thanks everyone. Yes, right. I, I hope everybody is uh, safe, stays safe. And if you don't have to go anywhere tomorrow, uh, stay home and, uh, you know, listen for the birds, right? <laughs> I want to remind folks too, um, next week is our final installment of North Country Live for this semester. Um, we're partnering with Trudeau Institute and Historic Saranac Lake for exploring vaccine resistance past and present and uh, register for that at nccc.edu slash live. Um, there were a limited number of in-person spots available for that talk at Trudeau as well. So there might be still some time to do that if you um, sign up um, as soon as you can. Thanks again to everyone. Thank you, Joan. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thanks again.